Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to the community live stream. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow, and this is the show that brings you not only the answers to the community, but the thought process, the journey of discovery, the reverse engineering that goes into that. So thank you for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Chuck Tomasi. I've been with ServiceNow for about nine years, customer for a couple of years before that and uh, bring to the show experience on the platform, custom applications and integrations. So that's where you'll find most of the content. The idea is to not only give you the answers to this, but take those skills that we share here, have a discussion between the people that are on live and the community discussions and learn what goes on to get those answers and then take those to your job and be a more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer. So with that, let's get started. If you are watching this on YouTube, thank you very much. That's not the community behind me. That's the wrong screen. That's the community. There we are. <laughs> so, thank you. Go ahead and uh, subscribe to the link you see right there on YouTube and uh, get the notifications. Turn on the little bell or icon or whatever it is to get the notifications that you will get. So when the show starts, you should see something like this. Yes, no, not that. <laughs> well, I lost my remote screen sharing capability, so we'll go with that. I had it a second ago. Eh, never mind. But uh, you'll get a notification on your mobile device or whatever to get to find out, hey, the show is live like Shane has done. Shane chimes in, hey, hey, and good morning, Carolyn Ramsport. Always fun to see the regular names in here. So why does it look like my title is slightly cut off on YouTube? Hang on, maybe my screen just isn't big enough. Let's, no, there is something amiss with the broadcast. Looks fine on my monitor monitor, but the URL on the bottom of the screen is truncated. I'm gonna have to look into that. Looks like I might have a uh, palette version issue. Everything else looks fine except how it's actually presented. Let me know on the chat if it is actually, it looks fine there. You can see, I, I can see the letters, but the bottoms of the letters are chopped off. Just doing a quick tech check. Maybe it's just my YouTube screen. Like. The bottom of the Y is chopped off and the, anyway. Thank you, <laughs> this, is, this is all fun. Uh, looks like my lower thirds are a little wonky, but all right, well, if it seems fine there, we're good with that. We have a mobile issue and a video lower third issue on this end. So thank you for verifying. I love doing this interactive and live. That one day last week where I couldn't broadcast, it was just, it was sort of lonely. <laughs> I didn't have you people to interact with, but uh, we got the content out there anyway. Thank you very much. We also can watch this on Twitch. So if you can't see it or it's a little weird on YouTube, then join Twitch and you can use it as a backup plan for a couple of weeks. The video sticks around kind of like our personal developer instances. After a couple of weeks, it's gone. <laughs> I don't want to talk about you. <laughs> I don't like to talk about your flair. <laughs> nice office space reference. Uh, we're among friends. We can do that, right? If you haven't seen the movie Office Space, where have you been? <laughs> Go watch it. It's a lot of fun. And the, the, the thing that I realized when it uh, came out is it works at so many levels. I had a VP that enjoyed that movie for completely different reasons than I did as an individual contributor. So enough about that. If you've got questions about ServiceNow, you want to ask a question, you've got scripting issues, whatever it is, go over to developer.servicenow.com. Oh, excuse me, community.servicenow. I'm jumping ahead. Community.servicenow.com. Post that in the right place. We've got different communities. So if you are asking about GRC, post it in governance, risk, and compliance. If you're asking about ITSM, put it in the IT service management. If you've got a developer question about scripting or service portal widgets, whatever it is, put it in the right place. You've got a better chance of getting people to answer it. So community.servicenow.com, lots of subject matter experts, lots of content, lots of great exposure experiences. Answered one this morning, you guys testing it out right now, so you never know. Sometimes the results are pretty darn quick, quicker than customer support a lot of times, and customer support usually won't touch a scripting question. Uh, if you would like to become a developer or learn more about being a ServiceNow developer. Maybe you're an admin, maybe you're new to the platform, maybe you've done scripting or coding in another place. Go over to developer.servicenow.com where you can get a free personal developer instance, free learning plans, 
Developer meetups. We've got one coming up in Phoenix next week. I got to check if it's on the events menu yet. Let's see. Do we have Phoenix in here yet? No. Why not? I'm going to make a note to check with Andrew and Dave and find out why not. Because it is over on meetup.com. And if I click my little Phoenix tag here, over 16,000 people worldwide are part of this community. And look, we have our next meetup on June 27th. Something tells me there might be something a little weird with the integration over there. So if you want to sign up for one of the meetup groups, be part of that community, go over to meetup.com slash pro slash ServiceNow Dev Program. You can see it right there at the bottom of the screen. See, I did that for you. We also have a webinar coming up. Put that away. Put me away for a sec. Next Tuesday, we now have less than a week to go till June 25th when we're going to be talking about the email client. And uh, there is quite a bit to know about the email client. Not just, hey, there's a little icon. Let's click that. <laughs> it's... Uh, very configurable and more configuration coming, I found out, in New York and even Orlando. So this little feature has been getting some nice love in the last few releases. And I want to share as much as possible with you next Tuesday. So go to the bit.ly link you see there, register, and I will see you online. Thank you very much for that. Any code that we write today is going to be in the, where is it, in the GitHub repo over at that bit.ly link that you see. Not as nice of a bit.ly link, but it works nonetheless. And if there's a folder there labeled 2019-06-19, this is the 19th of June, it's Wednesday, happy hump day, <laughs> we're going to have code in there and links in the community with the video, with the articles, will point directly to that video. I'll also put that direct GitHub link in the description of the YouTube video. So you can find it there. Hello, Lieberger. Hello, John. Hello, James. Who have we missed? I think we already said a few of these names. Let's get back to the community then. So we can get started. I'm going to start in my traditional way. I think that was probably the fastest pre-roll I've ever done. <clears throat> Got any questions? Let me know. I do a quick refresh. I'm going to start with the unreplied questions. See what's new. See what's happening. How to save record on load. Well, that's an interesting use case I'd love to learn more about. I am using a UI action to redirect a user to, a pr to and pre-populate an incident record with information from the previous record. For some reason, the data isn't captured in the list view until the user accesses and saves the record. Does a workaround exist for this? Let's take you on a journey. Can you share the code from the UI action? It could be that you want to create the record first, then redirect to it. That would be done something like this. And let's pull up a script editor for this. Hey, we get to write some script. First one. Something like this. As soon as we finish typing. Let's bring up Visual Studio Code. <clears throat> we are looking at building out some plugins for this so we can get the syntax editor working. Do the, the IntelliSense autocomplete. I'm going to create a new script. Never mind all this. This is, uh, I can probably be done with that. Let's get rid of the release notes, new script, and we've got uh, var inc gr equals new glide record incident. So instantiate a new glide record object on the incident table, inc gr dot new record, because I want to make a new record and initialize the value, inc gr dot o priority maybe equals current dot priority, something like that inc gr dot short description it could be current dot short description you figure it out add other fields and values here to suit your needs season to taste as the recipe always says and then finally we do our inc gr dot insert 
and action dot set redirect ink gr. Oh, redirect URL, pardon me. Ink gr. Pretty scary when you get that many APIs. Let's also put in an edgs info message. Incident created. Throw that up on the screen to be nice. And bring up the little code whizzy thing. That's not what it's officially called, but it is now. I just made up a new term. And away we go. Bell, <laughs> coin, <laughs> whatever I hit, replied. Okay. That way the record is saved before you get there and you have a way to redirect. The other way, this is an interesting one. I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, but you could, let me go to my personal developer instance and show you an interesting thing. Let's go to incident. I'm in global anyway. Go to the incident list and create a new UI action. Some of you may be familiar with the sysparm underscore query argument on the URL. So if I, let, let me just give you a demonstration of that. So if I go to the incident module and say, show me all the resolved ones, somewhere in this URL, I'll bring it out to the editor, somewhere in here, it says sysparm query state 3D is equal six. So it's saying state equals six. Sysparm query allows you to filter. Obviously it's, it's saying, hey, database, when you do this, let's query. It has a second function. So I would say I have none that are resolved, which is kind of weird. Let's look at unassigned. Here's some unassigned ones. And in which case it says sysparm query active equals true and assigned to is empty. There's my query. You probably can't see it too well on the mobile, on the, uh, on the YouTube, but that's what it says with the encoded URL of percent %3D. I translate that to equals. Very easy to remember because everything's in 3D these days. Not really. Let's go and create a new UI action as an example. I want to show you something because I've done this on record producers and I've done this on uh, interceptors as well. So configure. UI actions, there it is. I'm just going to make a new UI action and make that available as a, we'll do it as a link. Call this create new from here on the incident table. The order is fine. Not on new records because we need some content to copy over and show update is fine. We won't put a condition on here. Well, actually we could put a condition to make it active or whatever you want, but I'm going to leave it empty. And I'm going to take the code that I had. No, I'm not gonna take that code. I'm just going to say um, var q equals sysparm, it's gonna be a string, sysparm query equals short description percent 3d that's the equals plus current dot short description all right let's also do uh we'll take the caller id over as well and uh let's see yeah and i'm writing this with an encoded query caller ID percent, I'm not sure if that up caret needs to be encoded also, we're gonna find out. Percent 3D equals current dot, you know what, I should've done get value. Get value, caller ID. Got one in dotted notation and one that's not. Let's practice best practices and use get value to get the values out of our getters and setters. Let's get them the way they should be. Now that I've got this query string built up, I can do action dot set redirect. And normally we would put in something like current to stay on the page. You can also put in another glide record of ink gr like we did in the other one. This time I'm going to put in incident dot do a URL. Question mark plus that query that I just wrote. 
Okay, so it's going to do incident dot do. Oh, I got to do sys id equals zero. Sorry, sys id and minus one. Sys id minus one says create me a new record and tack on this sysparm query. So incident dot do take me to the incident form. Create a new incident because it doesn't have a sys id and use these as default values. You can pass in default values on the URL. If this still works, worked a few years ago, I'm gonna try it out now. So let's go to unassigned, number 39 is assigned to Bud Richmond, or the caller is Bud. The short description is trouble getting to Oregon Mail Server. And down here, I should see create new from here. Now it created it, I think something happened in the log. Let's go to the system logs and find out. No, maybe it did. Maybe it did not. Let's go to all. Newest, newest. I do not like that view. We did that yesterday. Give me the regular default view. Um, so it didn't create it. So we go to the logs. System. Logs. See what's happening. And script, 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 script. I'm not seeing anything out of the ordinary. Of course, when you want to run the table, you want to check this. The table cleaner always runs and fills up like 500 things. But that didn't happen yet. Let's do a GS info message on that. Maybe I'm missing a slash or something. Go back to my UI action. So UI actions. I don't want a UI action new record. That's going to take me to a new record. Let's just go to UI actions. And we're a little off track today, but that's okay. This is a learning experience. We're on a journey of discovery. Do I have my date updated field? I do. So let's sort backwards, get my latest one, create new from here and put in this. Let's do a gs.info q equals Make sure my query got correct. Q. In fact, let's put in another one. Var Earl equals. I'm going to change it and say incident dot do. Sys ID equals minus one. And plus Q. And GS dot info Earl equals. Just to see what's happening with these. And then change this to just Earl. Save that. Now it's in my history, so I'll be able to grab that easy enough. Go back to one of my incidents that I had here. Incidents. 9009 looks good. Unable to access shared folder by David Miller. And try our UI action. Create new from here. I don't see a new record. It didn't take me there. Did I spell something wrong? System logs. And it says Earl equals incident do. Sys ID and sysparm query short description. Unable to access the shared folder. Caller ID equals. Da, 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 da. So it's putting together the right URL. What's up with <laughs> this? Isn't a good demo. It's not working. So share from here. Redirect URL. I did it again. I did that this morning. That's twice today. For some reason, I can't get that on. I don't know why I'm not getting an error. That says, what the heck is that? So I forgot to spell the actual URL. Back to the incident. Let's find the one we were on. Unable to access shared folder. Create new from here. Takes us here. Filled in with David Miller. Short description is populated. Everything else is default. So that's how we got here. And you can see up on the URL, ding, ding. If I pop that in. Oops. Let's get rid of that. Paste that in. You can see here's my URL. So nav2.do. It's stuck on incident.do. Sysid equals Negative one, sysparm query equals short description, da 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 on and on it goes. 
So we have ourselves a successful one. Now the question is, can you, do you have to encode the query here or is it going to do it for me? Because it looked like it encoded, encoded some other stuff. What if I put equals there and equals there? Will it still get to the right place? Update that. Go to my list of incidents. Let's pick email servers down. Duplicate that one. And David Miller, email servers down. Okay, so you can make it easier to write. It's still going to encode it up here. You can see email server is down. It even encoded the percent 20 spaces. Although I'm not sure why it says percent 25 20. I'm not going to look at that. <laughs> email percent 25 20. What is that? No, oh, oh, percent 25 is a percent. So it's like double encoded it. So the first time through, it's going to say the, the encoded, then it's going to encode it again. Percent is a percent 25. And then when it decodes that, it becomes percent 20, which turns into a space. Whew. Glad I don't have to worry about that. Easy enough to just create this UI action. So little hint and tip about how to use sysid minus one to create a new record and sysparm query to populate some of those fields, whether it's from the current value or calculated value or whatever. Hope you found that mildly interesting. If so, don't forget the like button or the helpful link. Thank you, thank you. Next. <laughs> That's one. Uh, business rule help, please. Six replies. All right, can't resist. Usually don't jump into something that's this far down the thread. At the moment, the scheduled job runs on group table to certify members every 12 months, but I would like to make the schedule dynamic so that it runs after 12 months from last certified or 12 months from the date the group is created. Please help to achieve this. There is a, there is a field last certified on the group table. Okay, show all the replies. You can have the job run nightly and process only those records requiring update. Yes, that's the approach I would take. It will run a script that queries the group table and selects the records you want. Select all groups were certified 12 months ago and are now due. And then, of course, you would need to recertify them. Could you please give me the script to get this working? Add encoded queries, sys updated on relative... Da, da, da. I don't know if I would do sys updated on because what if somebody just changed the name? It's no longer certified. Using encoded query... Sorry, I have very limited scripting skills. This is when it gets dangerous, kids. When you ask for help in the community and you've got limited scripting skills, because 99 times out of 100, you're going to have to modify that code that comes out of the community. We don't know what your fields are called. We don't know what your data model is. So we're giving you examples, and you're going to have to modify them. So you might need to modify a field name. Also, how do I link the BR and certification schedule? Where does the business rule come in? I'm, I've kind of lost it. At the moment, we have scheduled job that runs as da, 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 da. What does the business rule... I don't understand where the business rule comes in. You can have run a daily job. Da, 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 da. If so, when the table goes on the when tab, insert update, update field... So the groups need to be certified every 12 months from the last certification date, or if a group is newly created, I would like the certification schedule to run 12 months from the time the group is created. There's a, there's a process involved here. Okay, so let's look at this image. Run on demand. I don't want to run on demand. Okay. Essentially, he's correct. What I would do is create a script include to do the certification part. What exactly is the certification piece? Did we get any code to that? Put your code here, okay? Can you explain what the certification process looks like or does? Is there code involved or is it 
are you just updating the last cert date on the group? When a group is created and certified, set the default date on your new field, on your custom field, to the current date. That takes care of your first case, not scare, takes care of your initial use case. The nightly scheduled job described above can address future cases, but without knowing what the certification process is, it's difficult to give you any details. I'm also still a little confused where the business rule needs to come in. Can you, the business rules, in case you don't know, are triggered on database. Let's fix that. Business rules are triggered on database operations. Create, delete, read, write. How do you see this getting involved with your process? Well, the fingers aren't doing so well this morning. And do, am I at 150? Yeah, no. That's why it seemed a little tiny. So there we go. Another answer. We have a few things in the inbox. Let's see what's happening. In the inbox, respond to some stuff. How to save a record on load. There's a response. Or is this because I am using update as opposed to insert? Well, I don't, you gotta share me your code. Hey Chuck, here's the code I'm using. Good, that's helpful. Update will create a record if there isn't a record already there. By the way, function save contact current dot update action set redirect URL current. That's just going to, you are using save contact set redirect. Those look the same. Did I miss something here? Show all replies. Here's the code I'm using. Glide Ajax, da 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 da. Yeah, we, that's way more complex. You don't need a client side anything and with Glide Ajax to do this. I don't understand why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it because I'm using dot update instead of dot upload? Uh, dot update will create a record if it doesn't already exist. Last I checked, it did. Um, I don't recommend using a client UI action in this case. It just introduces more complexity than needed. You don't need anything running on the client if your goal is to redirect to the new record anyway. So, give my UI action strategy a try. And this one was, you have to use this. Function save contact, current.update, set redirect current. That's going to update the current record and redirect it to the same page. I don't know what the point of that is. You are using this, uh, no, no. As I mentioned a couple of days ago, the order in which action dot set redirect happens is irrelevant. I even proved that on air. The order in which you put here, FYI, you can put action dot set redirect URL anywhere in the script, it doesn't affect what order it happens. It's simply, it's simply a header redirect in a sense, in effect. So you can put it at the top 
And when the script is done, it will redirect. I've tried this and it works. Still, redirect URL and what was the other one we had? Refer, no, Respond, return URL, that's what it is. So you can say, <laughs> go this way when the script is done, go this way to get you back. So you can say, redirect current and say, come back to the current record. Kind of cool stuff. All right, we had a question about uh, transforming a field and I wanted to give this a try just before the camera started. This might be good for flow designer if they are not good at script. Good point, James. We should go find that. Good point. I'm going to go pop that in there and reply again. And I'm going to give you credit. <laughs> From James on the community, this might be a good opportunity to run this opportunity to run this in flow designer. So you don't need to write script for a scheduled job. And let's give them also a link to flow designer in Madrid. Click, I clicked. Somebody pointed out that's not actually Madrid. <laughs> that icon is not Madrid, it's um, Barcelona. Come on, give me the Madrid page for crying out loud. Flow designer. Click, click, create link HTML back here, done. Another one. Thank you, James, good point. Love the live community interaction. Okay, back to where I was. Issue with transforming a date field. They said, hey, I've got this script or an Excel file that has a date formatted as month, day, year. Very common US format. And my date field on my table is importing, but they're always coming in blank. How can I do that? Because it says unable to format this date as string into the target field. I'm going to give this a try. I have a spreadsheet that I just made. Very simple, has name, date, count in a few rows, and I wanna see what happens when we try to do this. So let's go to, uh, I think Studio will be fine. Get my community live stream app that I love to beat up on, and let's create a new table that I can import this into. And I will call this, um, this is the hard part is making up dummy table names and variable names. Let's call this um, user count. Okay, there's my user count table. It's got a name, it's got a date. It's got name. We'll make that the display value just because we can. We'll make date a date field. We'll make... Uh, what was the other one? Count is an integer field. There, make that table. Now that I have this, let's go import something into it. We will create an import set. So data sources, new, user count import, terrible name, I know. Import set table, we'll call it imp user count import. That's already got IMP on it, so that works. It's going to be an attachment, and I'm going to attach my Google Drive, now community, sample date import file. Done, done. Attach the Excel file there, fingers crossed. It's an Excel file. Just check in the various fields. File, it's not zipped. Sheet number zero, header row zero. Looks good. Save that. Next, no thank you. Next, let's make a transform. It's going to go from here to the target table. User count. 
user count transform. Run business rules, don't have any, don't need any. And let's save that so we can do the field matcher just to see what happens. Okay, where is my UI action for field mapping? Didn't have one. Interesting. So, I should have a UI action to do my field mapping. I wonder if that's uh, broke, out of scope. What's going on? Well, let's try it anyway. Let's build one ourselves. Field map, map name, source table, source field. It didn't import the, um... oh, forgot. You have to do the test import. Back on the data source. I forgot. Let's get my latest updated data source. I have to load the sample records or all the records just for fun. So load all the records. Got to get them into the staging table because you don't know what fields are there until you know what the staging table looks like. So they are in the import set. I don't want to create a transform map. I already have one. Thank you very much. Somewhere in here I should have sort, 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 please. S, sort, C to A, user count transform. Got to load those sample records. Now I get this. Let's do the auto map matching fields. So I get name to name, count to count, date to date. We'll make something coalesce so that it doesn't uh, destroy data later or make duplicate records. And let's run the transform. Run it, run it, run it. There's the transform, there's the import set, go. And I need to refresh this because CLS didn't have my new table on it. CLS, user counts, and the dates came in fine. That's not what I said, and that's not what he said. Now, it could be my spreadsheet is different than his in some way. Like, I just typed in dates and formatted them, whereas he showed uh, an actual date field. And I've never seen that before. I thought that was just format as a date. So he's obviously running Windows and I'm running a Mac. That might have something to do with it. But what I suggested, and I want to see if this works anyway, what I suggested is in the transform map, go back to my history, transform map user count is, yeah, that's fine. No, don't bother coalescing right now. Is to note the source field and target field name. Mine happens to be or excuse me, date, date and U-date. So the target is date, the source is U-date. And say, run the script, and you get a script field. And I said, try this. I want to see if this works. Do target.date. Uh, first, I want to instantiate a glide date time object. So var gd equals new glide date. Okay. Then do a gd.set display value on source dot u date all right so what it was right source u date and then now that i've got that say target dot date equals gd dot set a get display value now if i'm messing with display values only it should work or I do target.date.setDisplay value. That sounds better. And then put this in here. So I want to get the display value out of my glide date object. Because in his scenario, it was not converting that properly. So I said, well, let's let's make sure that we can actually get an object and then set it. And he said, I'll give that a try. Oh, and then once that's done, save that. I am manually mapping it myself. Cancel that. So let's take this out of the map. I don't need that being mapped because I'm doing it for you. Back to the user counts record. 
There they there are all my wonderful records. Let's delete them. Delete those and do the import again. So go to import sets and in my import set tables, I pick the one that I've got and say, let's just reprocess that. So it's great. I set it back to loaded so I can run the transform and I run the transform and I get the records and I go to history to see if my user counts table has records in it. And now the date's blank. So my solution didn't work. <laughs> that wasn't any fun. Worked better when I just directly field mapped it. Excel date fields sometimes can be goofy, but one fix I did, this is from James on the community on the chat. One fix I did was actually swap the import field to a date field instead of string. Worked for me. Don't know why that worked better than the transform. So you're thinking of the import set? Look in here. Here's the import set. And if I look at the rows, for example, let's take one of these rows. It's a date field. Show you date is a glide date. So it imported, it recognized it fine out of Excel. And that's probably why it's working for me. We should check and see what it is for him. That's a good question if it comes back. Let's check the inbox. I like your thinking. And I've run into this before, particularly with string fields. If you've got, uh, let's say you import the first 20 sample records and the longest string you have is 30 characters, but somewhere further down in the spreadsheet, it's 150. It's going to truncate those because the string field is defaulted to 40 characters. It says, mm, I never saw anything longer than that. Or maybe your longest in the first 20 records is 86. It'll say length of the string field must need to be a maximum of 86. Later, you've got something that's 132. It truncates those. So watch for the length of string fields on that import set. You may need to tweak that import set record, the dictionary entries for that. Uh, how to save record on load. We're back to this discussion. How to save record. Okay, then I will test my code again because for me, it was not saving from values. Let me check. So going to go do a test. Uh, coding to find an SLA. We, we pulled this one up before, but I don't want to belabor this discussion. And what he's looking for is a series of records. For some reason, a scheduled job ran or records got updated. And now he's got two HRE to E award, HRE to E award, and two HR performance award, HR performance award. He wants to find all the records that have these duplicate SLAs attached to them. If it only has one of each, that's fine. So we wrote him a glide aggregate script, and there's some discussion going back and forth. I'm not going to mark that one as read quite yet because I want to continue on with content for this. So I'll bet you're right. It's probably not coming in, getting back to the import set discussion, it's not coming in as uh, a date field. So we may need to convert it to a date, do the import again, and then uh, it should work without any issue on the transform. So somewhere in here, Issue with transform date field. I think the last one was, thank you, I'll try this. Uh, my struggle ended in a jiffy. The transformation works perfectly for date fields, but two of the date fields that I used were coalesce. So I will try doing this on a field map instead of doing this transform map script it will update you. Okay, another thing to check. Another thing to check is what type of field is created in your uh, import set. When I look at the dictionary entry for mine, it showed a date and the date import needed, had no issues importing date to date. Um, go to import sets open yours, take a look at one of the records and say show, hopefully this is enough detail. What was that? <coughs> Excuse me, I didn't get to the mute button in time. IGF, show field name. Let's see, and right click, 
on the field label and say show field name to discover the details of that field type. So let's get back to my import set. Go into one of the records and grab a screenshot there. Let's grab a bigger screenshot so we can include a little more context. Put that in, I lost track of where I was, tab two. Well, I love when you do a copy and paste, it says that's not supported, but it pastes it in anyway. Thought we had that one resolved. And when you show you date, it says, da ding. Obviously, there's an icon, so it says it's a it's got a calendar widget. It's gonna work. Good thought, James. I'm a little late to the party. I had a similar issue earlier that was due to the field type on the import set table. It was created as a string rather than a date field. Yeah, that's that's what we're noticing here too, is it's not uncommon that you need to go into the import set record and verify these fields. When you load those first test 20 test records, go in and just check these things out and say, show you name, is 40 the right length? Is string the right type? Obviously, it can't be a reference field yet because it hasn't mapped the display value. Count. Is count an integer? Good. Because it's making assumptions when it pulls those in from, uh, uh, from Excel. Obviously, Excel doesn't have all the data types that ServiceNow does. And you'll notice this more when we get to New York with a feature called Guided App Creator where you can import the spreadsheet and it goes, Oh, this looks like a string. It's like, no, that's supposed to be a choice. Let me help you. So you can adjust them there much, much easier. It's just a drop down that says, this is a reference field. This is going to be a choice field. This is going to be a list field, whatever it happens to be. Can't wait to get Guided App Creator and show it to you. So let's go back. Do I still have three in the inbox? I should only have one in the inbox. Refresh. I have two in the inbox. Refresh. We're just going round and round on the same discussions this morning. This is real help, please, from LK24, who posted this. It says, we're using data certifications module to certify all the active groups within our organization. If any group has failed data certification, it needs to be removed. Don't remove groups. Deactivate them. The above certification schedule screenshot creates tasks for the manager to certify. Please see the screenshot below. <laughs> the above screenshot, see the screenshot below. That's funny. Okay, so in the certification task, da 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 da. Okay. So at what, just so I'm clear, your scheduled job, aka <laughs> future flow is simply pointing out which groups need to be certified and somehow starting the certification record, right? By the way, don't delete groups. Don't delete, remove groups. Not remote, remove groups. That could lead to a lot of bad, lost, uh, orphaned data. Instead, set the active flag field to false and use reference qualifiers where necessary to filter on only active records just to be certain just to be absolutely certain sys user group does have an active field right i thought so yes active true Ta -da. 
deleting records is almost always a bad practice. Avoid at all costs under penalty of death or termination or death and termination. <laughs> we did that one. We're back here. Let's go forward. Not possible to close chat windows on chat screen. Relationship between resource plan and project task. Uh, I'm not big on ITBM, but relationship between resource plan and project task. I don't even have ITBM loaded, so I can't tell you much about it. Let's look at unreplied. Calculating business days. Sounds like a schedule thing. Is there a way to do impact analysis for script include? What kind of impact are you looking for? Load testing? Is there a way to do any impact analysis for script include? We are trying to modify script include. We need to know what all the places the script include is being called. Uh, let's see. Pradeep wrote a very nice article. I'm going to find it. Not that one. Not the product doc. I thought I had another window open in here. All right. Let's find it this way. Code search on how to do a global code search. And I will show that to you as soon as I find this article. You will want a blog entry from Pradeep Sharma. That's the one. Thank you. Right at the top. Example of how to use code search. And tables included, which I think is about extended. But does he have global in here? Please note the scan will across global and scoped applications. Global. There's two mentions of global in here. It seems to only work for scope. Can I use this search script in global scope? Okay, let's point them to this and then say, don't forget to check the global so you can search everywhere. Yes, you can do this with the code search in Studio. If you check the box, what is it? Check all applications? I can't remember what that checkbox is called. Studio, come on. Studio, pick one, code search, search all applications. Let's take a picture after we paste the link so we don't lose our copy paste buffer. You might find this helpful. Check the box. And now let's go get our search. Bing. Copy. Not that one. Paste. Search in all applications. Okay. The answer to that is there. So what, let's take a quick example. And I am in safety app. So if I don't check that and I say, hey, is ArrayUtil in here anywhere? Because that's a script include, right? Somewhere I might be instantiating that. It says, let me look through the script fields in your application. I found nothing. But if I say search for ArrayUtil, I can choose what I want to search it. I can narrow this down and say, maybe I just want to look in business rules. But otherwise, I'm going to search in everything across all applications, and I'm going to get a lot of results because ArrayUtil is pretty popular. But I know that ArrayUtil is called in 47 or 42, which is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. 42 script includes one here, one here, and it lists them out. And then you get down to 12 business rules, one UI page, and a partridge in a pear tree. So you can search these out. And I think these 57 results are pretty much it. So global search is kind of cool when you're saying, uh, where is this used? Where is this thing used? We have five more minutes. What can we get in five minutes? Where's the code behind SP attachment button? Oh, probably buried deep in the platform. Interactive filter using parent-child relationships. Use number instead of sysid for standard change get REST API. 
Let's find out what that's all about. I'm trying to modify the out of the box API to get a standard change request. The script currently uses society, but I needed to search for number. Oh, I hope your numbers are unique. Can that be done with a script? Global standard change process. Find by ID society. Let's go take a look at standard change process. Is that a script include? What is that? Let's go look. We know how to do a code search. Code search. Search for everything for that. And see what we get. A couple of things. Standard change process is a class. Find by ID. Call standard change process SNC find by ID. So... Now we want to know where that is. And extends object standard change process. Oh, speaking of which, that just reminded me. Uh, recording is done on 37 lessons, 10, 11 labs, and a couple extra videos. So let's just call it 45 videos. Uh, for learning JavaScript on the ServiceNow platform. I promised to do this about six months ago. I apologize, I didn't get to it. Uh, I, I finished the first 18, and then life got in the way. Knowledge came up. Lots of other things happened. So you're probably going to see some differences between the first half and the second half of this series. But the content is all about getting administrators to become more effective developers. Uh, if you want to become a developer, and I, I had... One young lady in Las Vegas say, my two developers just left the organization and I'm left holding the bag and I don't know anything about scripting. That's a very common use case. When staff changes, when you change role, you want to grow your career, maybe you're new to the platform and you know JavaScript from somewhere else and you want to know those nuances. This takes you from soup to nuts. I mean, everything from let's talk about declaring variables and what the data types are and where the comments go and how the semicolons should be placed and curly braces right on through to classes and objects and arrays of objects and scripted REST APIs. So I look forward to releasing that in the next month or so on the developer portal, developer.servicenow.com is where you'll find those. There will be a playlist on the YouTube channel and uh, we'll interact with that. I suspect I may need to tweak them over time. Lots of code examples available on GitHub. The link will be in the first several videos and uh, I'll have a judicious readme file on that GitHub repo that goes with that. So now that the production is done, I am watching every single one of them to make sure that audio is okay, that I didn't say anything irrevocably <laughs> incorrect, uh, just issues like that. So it'll take a few days to go through all 50, 45 or 50, whatever it is of these videos. And I wanna get those out to you as soon as possible. I think that that's something that's been asked for. Uh, it's It's, not been asked for internally, but I saw a need and I want to post that to you. So as soon as they're up, they'll be on the developer portal, little or the developer YouTube playlist. So YouTube, just look for ServiceNow Developer Program. I'll make an announcement on the community and everywhere else when these are available. So look for those in the upcoming weeks, but I just wanted to let you know, production is finally done. It took almost six months to get this done because of other delays and other projects that took priority. So I'm finally getting back in front of my projects that were pushed off because of knowledge. Uh, lots of other great stuff coming up too. I don't want to tease you too badly. You know what? I don't think we're going to have a deep, deep chance to look into this. Let me do one more code search on that to find out where it is and what the impact would be. It looks like this is extensible. So standard change process uses standard change process SNC. I see five mentions of that. There is a standard of change process SNC in here. And that abstract, I would say you want to extend this class rather than that. So can you do it by this? Yes. Okay. Looks like this is an extensible class. I recommend creating your own and extending 
the boom, 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 boom. Oh, stupid font. Let's get rid of that. I hate it when it picks up formatting. So put in a text editor and put it back. No more formatting. Hurrah. Uh, class to your own and add your function to find by number. Shouldn't be a big deal. And if I had my videos, I'd point them to one of those. So that's doable. I have been striking the coin quite quick enough. But <laughs> you might have seen a sneak peek when I was in here looking at these uh, before. So let's don't save that. Don't save. Oh, I did want to save this one. So I will save that after the show is done. But uh, there are a lot, <laughs> a lot of lessons in here. Lesson one, two, three, four, five, six. I started with 19 on Monday. I started recording lesson 19 and got all the way through 37 and a few labs. So I need to flesh out that readme file. Lots of stuff coming. So look forward to that. I will keep you apprised on the situation as that happens. Back to the community and time for the salute to sign off. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today. Remember, if you find something helpful, useful, mildly entertaining, click that like button on YouTube or the helpful link in the community so that other people know there is something of use here. And I will see you next time. Until then, learn something, share something, be helpful. Take care. Bye.